Oh, okay. See you, Bhante. Thank you. Now, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, I am going to talk on uh, uh, right speech. Uh, you remember we are on uh, Noble Eightfold Path. We spoke on uh, right understanding, right thinking, and today, right speech. Even in the right understanding, I spoke on right speech to some extent under the uh, wholesome section. Uh, but today, uh, I want to spend this time specifically on right speech. I think when you you all remember, you may think uh, how often you say, said to yourself, if only I hadn't said that to her or him. You see then, if only I did not say this to her or him, meaning you regret because you spoke something not appropriate. You might say, when I, when I saw the look on her face, I knew that what I said had hurt her or his feeling. So you know that. So wrong speech causes us many problems. We causes us problems to our co-workers and get him into trouble. We speak in incorrectly, inconsistently and inconsiderately and offend others. So we spend a whole day in meaningless chatter and getting get nothing done. These bad habits of speech are not new. From time immemorial, people make wrong speeches and they themselves get into trouble and they put others into trouble. For the right speech, Buddha gave uh, guidelines. They are, it is always truthful. <clears throat> Number one, Number two, it is uplifting, not malicious or unkind. Number three, it is gentle, not crude or harsh. Number four, it is moderate, not useless or meaningless. And we have to make this, we must memorize this. If we restore to noble friends, restore to noble friends, even fool would become wise, said the Buddha. If he, if he 
resorted to noble friend, even a fool would become wise. That means to associate with noble friend, you become wise. Who is the noble friend? One who never lies to you, never slander, never make harsh speech, and never simply waste gossiping, waste time gossiping. Such a friend is an example. When you follow example of such a friend, we become wise because we like to follow their example and live that kind of life. <coughs> then we must understand children, animals, even plants can be trained to grow very gently or very roughly. For instance, if <coughs> parents, adults talk to children always harshly, roughly, with anger, always criticizing them, they blunt their growth, they blunt their emotion, and children grow up very, very unhappy, unhappily. When they grow up, as they are young, they cannot argue or retaliate to adults, so they hold all this, keep in their mind. When they grow, they try to find a way to express their anger, resentment, frustration. Because it is a, I know some people, some parents would say if a child does something wrong and repeat it again and again, sometimes parents would say, you are good for nothing. You cannot do anything well. You always do wrong things. So they kill their very beautiful, young, tender mind and spoil them, poison them, and make them very unhappy, nervous children. If, on the other hand, if parents speak very gently, kindly, softly, with love and care, when children make a mistake, if parents very gently, kindly, with love and care, talk to them very nicely, explaining the mistake in a very friendly way, children not only grow very healthily, with very healthy state of mind, but also they respect their parents and they never become uh, disobedient to their parents. You see, same thing with adults. You plant two plants, you pr plant two similar plants, and then you speak to one every day, very harshly, with anger, accusing something, uh, accusing this plant for, of, for something, and talk, talk roughly, and that the growth of that plant would be slow. If you talk to another plant, you planted both of them at the same time, and put the same fertilizer, water them same time, but the second plant you talk every day in gently, kindly, friendly way and very softly, with full of love, then you can see that plant 
grows very quickly, healthily and very beautifully. Therefore, even not only humans, plants and animals, if you talk to animals very roughly, animal becomes either very nervous or they become very uh, uh, fierce animals. If you talk to them very gently, softly, kindly, animals become very soft, gentle uh, animals. So, when we speak in the first place, uh, when we do the right speech, uh, number one right speech is uh, uh, the speaking truthfully. Uh, when someone uh, is questioned uh, as a witness and asked him, so good man, tell what you know. Knowing he says, I know. Not knowing he says, I do not know. Not seeing he says, I do not see. Seeing, he says, I see. He does not in full awareness speak falsehood for his own ends or others' ends or for more trifling worldly gains. So he always is very uh, uh, is, uh, speaking honestly, truthfully. There is a saying in uh, uh, Dhammapada that is, this is its translation, for people who speak falsely, who transgress in this one way and who reject the world beyond, there is no evil they won't do. That means a person who lies can do any wrong thing, any evil thing. Why and how? When he does, when he tells lie, he can do wrong thing, evil thing and simply say, I don't know, I didn't do it. So that person, one who tells lie, can do anything wrong without uh, being, without hurting his conscience because he doesn't care, doesn't care for the truth. He has no, uh, any remorse, so he can do anything wrong. And also sometimes people uh, lie in silence. For instance, there is a crowd and there was some uh, uh, murder or uh, attacking somebody and so forth and then uh, a police would come there and police would ask people, is there anybody in the crowd who witnessed this somebody attacking this person? somebody shooting this person, somebody killing this person. In the crowd, if you happen to be there, you saw it. You saw it, you saw somebody coming and stabbing, somebody shooting, you saw that. But you keep quiet. When the police says, you keep quiet. Because you think, if I tell, there would be retaliation. Or, if I tell uh, the, the, this person's uh, friends or relatives will be very upset with me, my relatives, my parents and so forth. Thinking of those things, uh, people might remain silent. In, in our the monastic uh, tradition, 
we have uh, every full moon and new moon day we have our uh, what we call confession that is monks and nuns requirement and in that, that during that time uh, one monk will read the rule he he, and, uh, he pronounce the rule uh, verbally read it from books if he don't rem- doesn't remember and then after every offensive rule every rule that if he violated if he violated we must tell in the in among them we must admit that i violated such and such a rule so the the reader of the rule will ask after reading the rule uh, is there anybody who has committed this offense at that time if everybody remains silent everybody everybody lied in silence whoever has committed it doesn't say doesn't admit it admit that he has done something offensive in silence he lies so therefore one even doesn't have to say anything to lie remaining silence one can uh, lie and that also is not uh, acceptable there are situation where uh, we have to be silent uh, the buddha did that when somebody came and asked the buddha is there life after death buddha kept quiet so this man waited waited for buddha's reply buddha did not reply when this man left vendamal ananda buddha's personal attendant asked the buddha vendamal sir why did not why why didn't you say anything to this man the buddha said ananda if i said that there is rebirth after death this man will think that he would be eternally existing life after life if i say no he would say he would be annihilated after his death so he for can fall into one extreme or the other extreme one extreme is eternalistic extreme other extreme is nihilistic extreme because buddha knew that this person coming from different tradition and did not have much respect for the buddha so buddha kept silent and therefore in order to uh, avoid this man getting into this extreme he did not answer his question situation like this uh, buddha said uh, he would uh, decide when to speak he said uh, in this course if you knew something was virtuous in this case the buddha himself if he knew something is untrue incorrect or not beneficial he would not say it such a speech the buddha does not utter if he knew that something was true correct and beneficial then the buddha knows the time to use such speech when his words were true correct beneficial and timely the buddha would spoke regardless of whether his words would be 
unwelcome, disagreeable to others, or welcome and agreeable to others. Only thing he wanted to express is the words must be true, correct, beneficial, timely. So even when we speak, we have to keep this in mind. And there also we must remember, Buddha said the when a person has taken rebirth an X is born in his mouth, an X, with which the fool cuts himself by uttering wrongful speech. Our <coughs> tongue is a weapon. When we abuse this weapon, we can cut ourselves and cut others. Just like uh, giving a razor to a monkey. If we use our tongue incorrectly, we hurt ourselves by abusing it, or we hurt others, and therefore we have to keep this in mind and uh, abstain from abusing our tongue. So the tongue does not wag by itself. We use it intentionally. And therefore, we must uh, uh, think, people say, watch your tongue. Normally people say, watch your tongue. But we must, Buddha said, watch your mind, because tongue doesn't work by itself. We think and then speak. Uh, that's why we yesterday, the other day, I, we spoke about right thinking. Right thinking. When we think correctly, rightly, with uh, compassion, understanding, we always use right words. Right, uh, we make right speech. So, just as we. <clears throat> Just as we choose how we will use the power of our acts, these days we use our computers, and therefore we must choose how we will use our speech in the computer. We must ask, will we speak words that awaken, console, and encourage others? Or will we cut them down, injuring ourselves in the process? Or slanderous talk, cruel gossip, lies, and crude or profane jokes not only abuse others but make us look like fools who are unable to wield the axe in our mouths without bloodying ourselves. We all know how we use our computers. That is very much like a weapon. We can use words in many different ways, either in a wholesome way or unwholesome way. So, most important solution 
you can make is to think before you speak. Think before you speak. So that is why we say instead of watching our tongue, we watch our mind before we speak. So I want to give these few hints to remember on right speech. Uh, if you are quick in writing, you may write because my talk is, I'm going to limit to half an hour and then I let you ask me questions. Now, <clears throat> skillful or right speech requires that you abstain from lying, malicious words, harsh language and useless talk. And lying by omission is still lying. Malicious talk is speech that destroy other people's friendship or damage their reputation. Verbal abuse, profanity, sarcasm, hypocrisy, and excessive blunt or belittling criticism are all examples of harsh speech. Harsh language hurts others and debase ourselves. Gossip and idle talk lead to quarrels and misunderstanding, waste your time and create confused state of mind. All unnecessary speech not motivated by generosity, loving friendliness and compassion is harmful. The test of skillful speech is to stop and ask yourself before you speak, is it true? Is it kind? Is it beneficial? Does it harm anyone? Is this the right time to say something? And lastly, you must remember, using mindfulness to strengthen your solution to say nothing hurtful <coughs> to use only soft, well-chosen words can bring harmony to any difficult situation. You must ask yourself, have I said something to hurt somebody yesterday? Am I, when you get up in the morning, you ask yourself, have I said something wrong? Have I lied? Have I spoke harsh words? Have I slandered? Have I gossiped yesterday? And today I am not going to do that. If we make that kind of determination every day, our we can train our mind always to speak correctly at right place with right words to the right person at right time. These are the requirements. We have to choose right words and with right intention to the right person at the right time. Uh, when these qualities are fulfilled, you make right speech. Now, friends, I think I must stop here and I let you ask me questions like you did last time. You have to speak up. Uh, my hearing is not very good, so you have to speak up and then uh, we try to get everybody engaged in discussion.
Okay. Who asked the first question? Either you write the question on the margin or okay. Where is your question? Um. Yes? Um, I have a question about, so, um, as you said, in the morning, you have to think about, like, uh, did you, um, like, slander yesterday? Did you have harsh speech yesterday? Did you lie yesterday and, um, do any bad things yesterday? But, um, you think, if you did, you think that you won't do it today. Uh, but what happens if, um someone makes you mad and you really feel like to do it, um, how do you control that feeling? Ah, uh, that is very good question. If somebody uh, makes you mad, at that time you have to be very patient, very patient. When you are mad, look at your mind. When you are mad, you don't feel happy. You you feel very uh, unhappy. We call it is a sort of a, sort of suffering. So you cause this suffering by getting upset, getting mad. Instead, if you think this is a very good training, training to be patient. Uh, Anaya, your name is Anaya. Yeah. Yes, Anaya. Uh, we learn to be patient from our childhood. A patient, we 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 don't become patient uh, all of a sudden. We have to train ourselves. Uh, earlier, the better earlier the better. So, when you are patient, you have to wait uh, and see why that person said something or did something to hurt you. Either because of jealousy, uh, because of the fear, uh, because that person has something else happen to that person, uh, somebody else has hurt that person and that person with that hurtful feeling, say something to hurt you, you don't know the background. And therefore, if you are patient and wait and wait, then after you, after sometimes, after a couple of hours, or after a few hours, uh, you can approach that person, say, uh, I was hurt when you said such and such. I was really hurt, and uh, I was wondering why did you hurt me? Uh, you don't gain anything by hurting me. I did not say I did not do anything to hurt you, uh, and that that person will feel bad, and then apologize to you. 
if you practice patience, you can even change the other person. If you are upset when the person did something to make you upset, you uh, you fulfill that person's wish. Sometimes somebody may say something or do something just to upset you, just to test you. If you are upset, that person will think, oh yes, my plan works. <laughs> I said such and such a thing to hurt so and so. Yes, that person got angry and hurt. So the person will be happy to see you upset. But if you don't get upset, don't get hurt, then uh, you can uh, make the other person feel regret, sad, and then perhaps that will help you tremendously. Uh, if you are patient, I'll tell you a story of Venerable Sariputta. Venerable Sariputta was uh, the, one of the chief disciples of the Buddha. And everybody knew Sariputta was an excellent, supremely enlightened monk. One day, Venerable Sariputta was going on his arms round with his arms board in his hand. Then there were a few uh, Brahmins. Uh, one of them said, that monk, pointing to Venerable Sariputta, said, that monk is excellent monk. He has a lot of patience. Then the other Brahmin said, I can show you uh, uh, how pa patient he is. He is not that patient. Let me go and test that. He went to Venerable Sariputta from behind. He gave a very big blow to his body. Venerable Sariputra was thrown few feet because the blow was very strong. He never expected something like that. Then Venerable Sariputta stood up and she continued to walk. This man felt so bad because Venerable Sariputta did not even turn back to see who hit him, who beat him, did not see, did not turn back. He simply, as if nothing happened, he continued to walk. This man felt so bad and he came in front of the, in front of Venerable Sariputta and apologized to him. Venerable said, please forgive me, I uh, gave you a blow. Buddha said, it's okay, I forgive you, no, no, don't worry, you go. Then this man felt still very bad and he said, if you really forgive me, please come and have lunch in my house. So Venerable accepted that invitation, went to his house and this man gave him dana, lunch, food. Venerable Sariputta ate. While he was eating, outside this man's house, there were a lot of big commotion, very big demonstration. Many people heard that this man hurt Venerable Sariputta and therefore they wanted to beat this man. They would said that, get him out, get him out, get this plug, club, this is rock and we beat him on his head and so forth and so on. They were saying all kinds of slogans to show their anger. Venerable Sariputta thought, <laughs> He's not going to <laughs> go well this, with this man. Let me help him. After eating, Venerable Sariputta gave him his arms ball and came out of the door. When the man was carrying his arms ball, these people said, Venerable Sir, take your arms ball back. Venerable Sariputta asked, why? We want to beat him. Venerable Sariputta asked, why do you want to beat him? Because he beat you. Did he beat you or beat me? I forgave him and that is over. You go back, go home. And he saved this man, saved these people and settled the commotion so friendly way. See the amount of patience Vendabar Sariputta had. Children, we all are not Sariputtas. 
But Sariput uh, uh, had this passion not in a second or few minutes or a few hours. He trained himself. He did not become patient very quickly. He trained himself slowly and gradually. And uh, patience is the the weapon in a battlefield. Patience is the weapon to win a battle, quarrel between people. And therefore, when somebody does something to hurt you, don't get upset. Just be patient and think of a way to talk to the person. That person who hurt you will be very, very sorry. Okay? Very good question. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yes. Tehasa. <laughs> Don't have it. Can you ask someone that? Yeah, who is that? Is it with that? Nalin's iPhone. Uh, I did not hear the question correctly. Could, could you repeat it? Have you talked to someone that is being very negative? It's still not clear. How to talk to someone with a negative tone? <laughs> uh, can anybody repeat that question clearly because your phone uh, voice uh, is not good. Handrani, the question uh, is, what to say to someone that has a negative tone? Ah, <laughs> right, right, right. What to say to someone who has a negative thought? Negative tone. Negative, negative, uh, negative tone, negative tone, yes. Uh, then again, uh, we have to be very uh, mindful and uh, try to find out why the person has negative tone in that person's speech. Because somebody may be uh, not appreciating what you do, what others do, and therefore they uh, make uh, negative remarks in their speech. Uh, we have to uh, practice metta, loving friendliness towards such people, because some people have uh, been uh, trained by their uh, parents, adults, teachers, and so on, to think in the negative way. And we have to, negativity can be overcome by positive thinking. Positive thinking. Let that person be negative, tone may be negative, and yet, we remain positive, we remain very compassionate, mindful to understand that person's mental state. It is not very easy. Some people are uh, negative tone always can irritate others. But when we, uh, when we uh, practice uh, mindfulness, compassion, and try to understand the background or situation of that person, uh, we will not be upset with somebody's negative tone. I know uh, 
that is happening in the society and we have to uh, train ourselves not to react to negative tones in their speeches not to react we have to be very mindful we practice compassion because the people who have negative tone in their talk uh, are very unhappy people we don't want to follow their unhappy examples we want to remain uh, positive and uh, therefore out of compassion we must uh, tolerate it and uh, we don't get uh, uh, upset uh, about it yes and that is what i think we should do <coughs> and uh, okay okay any other question Yes. So, yes. Um once you do um like let's say um you did the bad thing so do you get like a result like a bad result? When we do something bad uh if it is uh, unintentional uh you may feel bad uh that time and then it will be over when you do something bad you did it unintentionally you didn't have intention intention to do that bad thing it is it sometimes happen so you have no control no intention if you intentionally do something bad then you have result that is what we call karma if you do something intentionally to uh, hurt somebody then you later on feel very bad and that is the result of that intentional bad thing and therefore if it if it happens without any intention you will regret at that time and after that no more uh, bad uh, unwholesome results okay Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going I would like to ask a question too. Okay. Uh some Buddhist monks uh even as nuns and monks of other religions uh they take a vow of silence. Uh what is the significance of that? Ah uh. Uh, silence is uh, total silence is not approved by the buddha uh, but silence in uh, meditation is very important in the traditions where they observe silence they do it for a certain period of time may not be the entire time uh silence is important to think of the dhamma to practice meditation and buddha recommended uh, places uh, where there is less sound appasadda appanigosa vijana vata manusara seya patisallana sarup five qualities in observing uh, or selecting quiet place silent place five one is less sound appasadda abbanigosa less uh, cacophony so to say talking many people 
then Vijanavate, uh, not human traffic moving here and there, uh, and suitable for hiding away from people, and uh, also conducive to practice meditation. In that environment, Buddha did not say to go to a place where there is no noise at all, which we cannot find. So when a person selects such a place, uh, one can stay in silence, practice in meditation. And if, it, if there is a tradition that uh, uh, has a sort of, a, as a rule, uh, to observe silence for a certain period of time, uh, that is good only for if the person used that silent period to develop the mind, to overcome defilements. Somebody may be silent, may not utter words, but inside, inwardly, person may have a lot of defilements, greed, hatred, delusion and so forth. And therefore, the silent itself is not doing anything to us to improve, but using that silence to remove our inner defilements is very valuable. And that Buddha recommended, and that's what we, even Buddha did that occasionally, went into silence, sometimes two weeks in silence, uh, in order to revitalize his, uh, or regain his energy, uh, because he has been working with people many hours a day, and therefore he went for silence. So uh, I think that is, I think that may be enough for the answer. Thank you, I'm Tarani. You're welcome. <clears throat> Is it uh, Chandana? Uh, yes, Hamdrani. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> working with our children and uh, wanted to ask you that question. Okay, very good. And any other question? We uh, have, um, yes. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, uh, I also have a question. Yes. Uh, it's about the communication between children and parents. Sometimes the, the parents have to raise the voice and be stern, and uh, and sometimes uh, it's a little harsh to get things done with children. And uh, so, how do you look at that? You know, uh, if even if. Uh, ch if children, certain times they become a uh, little wild, uh, noisy, uh, appear to be disobedient, and so forth. At the same, at that time, parents have to think the children's mind are very tender, growing. They like to learn. They are ready to adjust. They are like uh, very soft people. Physically they may be even grown, but mentally they are still growing. Taking all this into consideration, uh, patients themselves have, parents themselves have to practice restraint, uh, and uh, think of a way to uh, train them. Psychologically, it even according to Dhamma, it is more effective than shouting, raising voice, and making children uh, sort of uh, frightened. Uh, when they when parents raise their voice, they will be frightened and out of fear they might do certain things, but they don't have respect. 
to parents. If the parents are very patient and think of a way, because I know parents shout at them out of love, parents love their children very, very much. That is their treasure, that is their property, that is their, you know, part of their life. And they want their children to grow very nicely with in good health, physically as well as mentally. Physical health itself is important, but mental health, health is even more important. With the mental health they grow, physical health they may fall sick and go to doctors and so forth. The mental health can last entire life. Therefore, I think at that time parents uh, have to be, as I mentioned earlier, be very, very patient and try to understand a way uh, to talk to children, to prevent them from doing wrong things, whatever the wrong thing it may be, and uh, educating them the, the benefit of doing right thing and the, the disadvantage or harm of doing wrong things. Uh, they must play mostly not only pa pa what you call parental role, but advisory role. And sometimes some, at, after a certain age, parents have to be like, behave like friends of their children, just friends cordially, friendly, kindly, with love, with very great skill, uh, they have to train them. So the <laughs> right speech is always important. <laughs> okay. Excuse me, Amitra? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh -huh. So, like, what if you know, someone asks you, like, a question, like your friend, and, like, you don't want to insult them, so then is it okay to lie, or is that, like, bad? No, no, no. Even at that time, you wait and you think of a correct way to answer the question. You can tell the person, I cannot give you answer right away. Let me think. Let me uh, find out correct answer. Uh, if you think your answer would hurt him, you tell him, then let me think about it. And I answer your question later. Don't, uh, I, I don't forget it. I answer your question later. If you know that the answer is going to hurt him, don't ask him or don't answer the question right now, right at that moment. Wait. And then uh, if the person uh, in a very, ask a question in a very bad mood, of course we have to wait to, uh, for him to calm down, come to his senses, and then very, in a very friendly way. You can tell, remember you asked me such and such a question. That time I did not ask, answer the question because I thought if I answered it, you might misunderstand me, you even might get uh, hurt. I don't want to hurt you giving answer. In reality, answer to your question is this. Uh, please don't misunderstand me. Take it lightly and uh, continue our uh, friendship or association or something like that. <clears throat> we, we, we train ourselves, uh, children and adults. I tell you, in my life, uh, I have people ask me many, many, many hurting, insulting, personal, questions. I never get angry. <laughs> I always think a way to answer the question. I may be hurt, 
but I never upset the person who asked me the question. And then I saw the results, beautiful results. This person many years, 10 years, 20 years later, <laughs> they come to me and apologize to me. Uh, so I have seen that. So when we are doing right thing, we always are very happy now and happy in the future. Okay, thank you, Commodore. Okay, now I think I have to close it. Today I am very busy, this morning also gave <laughs> a talk. Then people came for Dana, and 30 people came from various places, especially somebody's father passed away, a young man, only 50 years old, and uh, he died of COVID. And he, his uh, student, you see, all his uh, student, uh, Sri Lankan students in that university came to offer dana today. So I was with them also. And now I'm tired and thank you very much for coming and encourage others to join this. And we will continue talking on uh, for eight Noble Eightfold Path. Today was the third step. And also, if you have time, read the book that I wrote on this subject that is called Eight Mindful Steps to Happiness. Eight Mindful Steps to Happiness. You read that book, all these things are given in very good detail. Okay? <clears throat> okay, thank you. See you later. Thank you, Hamdrani. Thank you.